Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're delighted that you could join us again this week as we continue our journey through managing for the master till he comes. An exciting quarter. We are now, well, a third of the way through with this lesson. This is lesson number four. We're talking about offerings for Jesus. Last week, we took a look at tithe and the importance and the significance of that. This week, we look at offerings. How are they similar? How are they distinct? And what's the purpose of them? Our guest this week, once again, is Ed Reed. He is the author of this quarter's Sabbath School lesson. He is also an ordained minister and a licensed attorney, and we're delighted to have him here with us again. Before we dive in and start looking at this very fascinating subject, let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us together again today to continue our study of your word and to better understand finances and how they play a role in our spiritual lives. We ask that you'll bless our time together, and we thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ed, welcome. Good to have you with us again. Well, thank you, Eric. It's good to be here. So let's talk for a moment about, actually for, for about a half an hour, about offerings for Jesus. I want to I wanna read the memory text to get us started today. It comes from Psalm 116, verses 12 through 14. It says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So what role do offerings play in the life of God's people? What's the purpose of offerings? Well, the purpose of offerings is basically to show our thanks to God for his blessings to us. And interestingly enough, it's also very much a definite part of our worship experience. The, we'll, we'll look at some of the passages in the Bible that talk about God says, don't appear before me empty handed. In other words, bring a gift. Uh, there was an experience when young Saul was going to find his father's donkeys, you remember, and they were way down at Dothan and they couldn't find him. They heard that Samuel was there and they said, well, let's go ask Samuel. And then they, what, you, you know what they asked next? And that is, what shall we do? What, we can't go. We have, an off, we have to get an offering together. They wouldn't go even to see the, the minister without an offering. And the interesting part is, the Lord tells us not to appear before him empty handed as well. So what we're wanting to do is to follow the counsel of scripture. And there are many different offerings in the Old Testament. There were, for example, uh, sin offerings that people were given in response to their God's grace and forgiveness, d taking the guilt away from their lives. There were thank offerings given in response to God's blessings to them of uh, health and prosperity and sustaining power. There were also offerings for the poor. And we'll talk about that later in the quarter but then to also to maintain the house of worship. These are all coming from our 90% that's left after we've given our tithe. These are discretionary offerings, so it's up to the individual to decide how much it is. So there's some choice in the matter. Some people may give more, some people may give less. Like you said, it's not the same thing as the tithe. That's defined as a tenth. But I want to read a statement here now from a book called Councils on Stewardship, page number 18 and then give you an opportunity to, to make some comments on this. Here's what it says. The Lord does not need our offerings. We cannot enrich him by our gifts. Says the psalmist, all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. Yet God permits us to show our appreciation of his mercies by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God he has provided no other. So how is it that our offerings can show our thanks to God? Well, one thing here is that there's not a percentage given in the Bible. It's up to us to demonstrate what we're really thinking in our hearts and whether or not we've been transformed from selfishness to loving. So the idea is if we want to show God we're thankful, then we should be part of his team. Uh, you remember, for example, that the story of the prodigal son in, in the book of Luke when he came back, the father forgave him and gave him the ring to sign the, the, the uh, checks again. And it's really interesting that we're a part of God's family. That's what the whole lesson is about, that how do we respond to the master? And so we respond by managing his affairs Christianly, biblically, and showing, showing, demonstrating this with our offerings. So you might say to a greater or lesser extent, our offerings or lack thereof are an indicator of our spiritual position or condition. That's true. And the matter of fact, it's interesting that uh, 
the Bible talks a lot about money, and, and especially in the New Testament, Jesus, about one every, out of every six verses in the New Testament talk about money management and our attitude toward money. And the bottom line is, the Lord wants us to prosper and be in health, but he doesn't want us to become selfish. In fact, we're told in some places that the Lord would have blessed people more, but they would, would have hurt them. So, in other words, they would have caused them to be selfish and to hoard things. And I, I actually believe that God has given us the opportunity to demonstrate how we feel about his gifts to us, and that's the way we do so with our offerings. I've heard it said, and this was a few years ago, that if you want to know where someone's priorities are, take a look at their checkbook. Now, we don't so much have checkbooks today. Well, of course, they still exist, but they're not used quite as much. But if you look at someone's bank account and, and where money goes, that's a pretty good indicator of where their priorities are. That's their checking, their credit card statement, for example, yes. Yep, so that credit card statement will give you a pretty good idea of, uh, of where you are spiritually with some things. Now, the next question comes, Ed, we know for tithe that tithe is 10%. That's defined as, as 10%. But the offerings, as you mentioned a moment ago, there's, there's a discretionary element woven into these offerings. Are there any guidelines that we might have to give, at least, to give us at least some idea of how much or where it should go? What kind of guidelines do we have for that? Well, as you mentioned, the tithe is basic, and God has told us that it's a tenth of our increase and so on. But for the offerings, that's discretionary, and it's based on several things. One is, we just read in the memory verse, Psalm 116, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? In other words, how thankful are you that you don't have the guilt of sin anymore and you have the hope of eternal life? Another one is from uh, Deuteronomy 16, verse 17, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. So it's based on the ability. It's hard for some people, some people to believe, but I actually think, and I practice this in many ways, that our offerings should be bigger than our tithe, especially when you get to be my age and you're debt free and so on, and your income is sufficient that you can make larger contributions than your tithe. In other words, Tithe is only the beginning point, Eric, and our offerings come after that, and that's how we demonstrate our love and our concern for others. So tithe is a, is a starting point. Tithe is a, a minimum, if you will. And, and God says if we don't return that tithe to him, we're actually robbing him, which, of course, none of us want to be uh, guilty of robbing God. So we start with that, and we do that in faith. And from there, we build the, the offerings, or we give the offerings. Uh, sometimes I've heard people say that they give a another tithe in offerings or another tenth of their income in offerings. Some people can do that. Some people uh, are able to do less. And as you mentioned, some are able to do more depending on where they happen to be. When we talk about offerings, a lot of times we think about, well, that's, that's part of church. You know, they send the plate around or, or we put the envelope in the box or uh, some churches have a, a little kiosk in the entryway where you, you swipe a debit card or a credit card or, or something like that or tap these days, uh, is, is offerings, the giving of offerings, is that really a part of worship? Well, that's a good question. I want to do two more short verses before I get to that one. In Luke, when Jesus sent, Luke the 12th chapter, Jesus, Jesus sent out the disciples to be missionaries for him. He said, freely you have received, freely give. In other words, be as generous as God is for you. And then also, it's interesting that... Uh, we're told to whom much is given, much shall be required. So if you don't have much, you're not going to give much. But what, if God has blessed you sufficiently to give large offerings, then that's certainly appropriate. So you ask about worship, and I'll just tell you this. It's kind of interesting. The Bible does not give what we call an order of service, like you have the scripture reading and prayer and the special music and the sermon and closing prayer and all of that. We've come up with that just to be orderly. But when you read the Bible and you look at worship services, several things are always present in a worship service. And we're, we're talking about at least four things. And that is study or preaching, uh, like we do with our Sabbath school lessons, for example. Prayer is always part of it. There's someone, there's a place in worship for private prayer, individuals praying, study groups, for example. A corporate prayer where somebody will have the congregational prayer for, and the others will pray in their hearts. And then, of course, music has always been a part of it. In fact, the Levites were responsible for the music. You know, there was a Levitical choir. And it's interesting that music, good music, is always part of worship to me. And then 
a fourth one, and I only mention it as fourth position because that's what we're moving toward, is our tithes and offerings. And that's why Moses reminded the children of Israel not to come before the Lord empty-handed. In other words, you bring your offerings as part of your worship experience. So it's not like, let's take the offering and we'll get down to church. Offering is part of church. Okay, so offering is, is a part of church, which brings me to another question. Uh, how frequently should a person give offering? Again, we're kind of getting down to, to um, practical things here. If a person is paid twice a month or, or bi-weekly, um, how frequently should they give an offering or tithe? Should it, should it coincide with their paychecks or should it be once a month or what's any, any guidance on that? Well, it's interesting you ask that question because the Apostle Paul was collecting money to go to Jerusalem to help the poor, you know. And he says, on the first day of the week, set aside what you can do for this so that when I come, I don't have to collect the offering. So that might be some kind of a model. I would suggest that when people look at their income, that they try to do something on a regular basis. Now, we get our income monthly in retirement, and this is interesting. So we actually have our largest offering is at the last Sabbath of the month. Every month it's that way. The treasurer can count on it. God can count on it. But I think, I like to believe that I'm giving an example to others, young people and others. So we try to have some kind of an offering every Sabbath. It's not nearly the size of the one we give on the last of the month, but special projects. Our church has uh, uh, a little thing where they have the children go around after the deacons collect the regular offering and collect the lamb's offering, if you please. And the little kids enjoy this and the people enjoy it, watching them do it and so on. And their eyes light up when you hold out a dollar to put in their gift. So I always want to make sure that I collect, I have some dollars to give out. Some people give more than that, but it's important that we set an example that we don't just say, I don't have anything today. So make sure that you've got something in your pocket, something in your purse, something in your wallet. Uh, every time to set that good example, but depending on when you actually receive paychecks, whether they're regular paychecks or if you, you know, sell homes for a living, it comes when you get a sale or you sell cars, uh, but, but return that tithe and give that offering on a very regular basis uh, in, in conjunction with when you get the income. Because I imagine sometimes if you, if you just take care of yourself first and you plan to do, you know, give the offerings and so forth at the end of the month, uh, you may find at the end of the month you don't have what you had expected to have. A uh, very good advice, Ed. If you're enjoying this quarter and you want to get more out of it, I want to encourage you to pick up the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath School lesson. It is Managing for the Master. You can find this book at itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop. It's the companion book to this quarter's Sabbath School lesson and gives you additional insight some incredible stories, some, uh, some wonderful guidance on how to get more out of this subject uh, so that you can be blessed by it and others can be blessed by it as well. In just a moment, we're going to come back with part two of our look at offerings. We'll be right back. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Welcome back to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're taking a look today at offerings for Jesus. What role do offerings play in, in our worship experience? And on Wednesday's lesson, Wednesday is entitled, God Takes Note of Our Offerings. Now, somebody might be wondering, you know, is God sitting up there with a, with a legal pad uh, saying, Eric gave this much, but he had this much, and uh, as if God is an accountant, um, is, is that what 
Is that what it means God takes note of our offerings? Does he really take note of our offerings and what does that look like? The answer is yes. And we know that from two, two stories in the Bible. One of them is Jesus intentionally took his disciples to the courtyard of the temple where the treasure chests were, had them all sit down and watch the people giving their offerings. We learn that from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. And they saw these rich people coming and dumping in large coins with a big commotion in the, in the, into the offering plate, or offering container, like offering chests, actually, what they had out there. And then this poor widow lady came and she just dropped in two copper coins. Now, Jesus was close enough to her to observe that it, there was two copper coins. This, you know, this is the, the, we hardly ever carry change anymore and I never have any pennies in my pocket, but she did. Now, this is interesting because Jesus took note of that. And he said that her offering would be commended because she gave more than the others because she gave from her poverty and they give from their riches. So she, she made a contribution. She had given everything she had to do that. And it's also interesting that this is the only offering that Jesus ever commended, not because of its amount, but because of the spirit that she gave it in. And it's also interesting, I have people talk to me once in a while, well, I don't know that I want to support the church because the conference was doing this or they spent money on the youth camp and I didn't think that was appropriate or whatever it is. But the only offering Jesus ever commended was when the widow lady gave her last two cents to the church that was so corrupt that they were just about to kill him. So if you believe this is God's remnant church, this is a place to support and let the others give account to God for their actions. So it sounds like what you're saying is we're either blessed or not blessed based on the fact that we give, not on what ends up happening with that money. Exactly right, yes. All right, very good. I wanna read a, a quote here from the book, Councils on Stewardship. This one comes from page 175. It says, but Jesus understood her motive. She believed the service of the temple to be of God's appointment and she was anxious to do her utmost to sustain it. She did what she could, and her act was to be a monument to her memory through all time and her joy in eternity. Her heart went with her gift. Its value was estimated not by the worth of the coin, but by the love to God and the interest in his work that had prompted the deed. So that's an insight into where she was giving from, it sounds like. Yes, indeed. That's an amazing statement. Now, there's an, another story that uh, I want you to comment on here. Uh, this Cornelius. Talk to us about Cornelius and what happened there. In the early church, there were several things that were happening. One is that God was wanting the gospel to go to the whole world. And people right need to recognize that it wasn't just the Jewish people that needed to hear the message. So, but they weren't speaking to the Gentiles too much. But the Gentiles were spontaneously helping the cause. And one of those people was named Cornelius. He was the centurion of the band of the Italian group. And the, the Acts, the 10th chapter, the book of Acts, the 10th chapter, talks about it in the first four verses. He was a devout man and one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now that's the kind of guy he was. He was giving offerings to help people and he prayed a lot. Now we know that if we pray, God hears, right? What if we give? Does God notice? Apparently he does because God sent an angel down to his house, incredible as it may seem, in a vision he evidently about the ninth hour. You know, I like this situation because in the Jewish calendar system or the keeping of time, they had they divided the daylight hours into 12 segments. So six o'clock is halfway through. That's always noon when the earth the sun's up at, 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 at its zenith. So nine, the ninth hour would be the mid-afternoon. So he's praying then, mid-afternoon, not just his morning devotions, but he took, chose the middle afternoon to pray. And an angel came to him. This to me is amazing because he said, Cornelius, and when he looked up, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Heaven is taking notice of your prayers and your giving. And as a result of that, he told him in that interview, send men to Joppa to get one called Simon Peter and he'll come back and give you the gospel. But this all started with his faithfulness and giving alms. A big story, really, really. In, in Matthew 6, verse 21, uh, speaking of Cornelius, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He, his heart was where his money was going and, and God took notice of that, you said. That's amazing, isn't it? You can almost say it the other way, too. Where your heart is, your treasure will be. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
So if you want a cause for the ministry, contribute to the cause and your heart will be there also. Let's take a look at Thursday now. Thursday is, some people may not quite be at Thursday, but some people could be and should be, and, and certainly some people are. Thursday is called Special Projects or Big Jar Giving. You mentioned a, a few moments ago about special projects or special gifts that you can give. Is there a place for large or special gifts and offering, not just your, your average everyday giving that you regularly do or that you do on a regular basis, but some big project that maybe you're passionate about? How does that fit into the grand scheme of things? This is a good question. I have a practical illustration to give you an answer for that. Assume for a moment that we just check on how people give offerings. Most people give their offerings what is called discretionary income, liquid assets like cash or whatever they have in their wallet or in their checking account or their, their savings book or whatever it is, money market accounts. And studies show that's about 9% of our assets. And the, the rest of it is 91% is in non-liquid assets invested, for example, in your home and in your assets like livestock or property in other ways. So if we take each percentage and give it 10 pennies, that would use up a thousand pennies. So 99% for the, the liquid asset gifts from, that's what most people give their offerings from, their liquid assets. Nine, that would be 90 pennies and put that in a little jar. Then if you take the 91% and give 10%, 10 pennies for each percent, you have 910 pennies and that have to fit in a quart jar. So you have most people giving from the little jar. And, and big gifts come from the big jar. Does that make sense? It does. Okay, yep. so here's what we do. We look at this and see something very, very interesting. In the story of the alabaster box that Mary broke with a sparknard inside at Simon's Feast, you remember that story, which is a very interesting one. Something else interesting happened. Mary's alabaster box with a spikenard in it cost her 300 denarii, which is an entire year's wages. So would that be a big gift or a little gift? That's going to be a big gift. It's a big jar gift for sure, no question about it. It wasn't just discretionary income, whatever she may have had in her pocket or purse. The interesting thing is that Mary's gift of denarii was a big gift, but it also recognized something unusual, that Judas then, because of that, betrayed Jesus for a small jar gift of only 30 pieces of silver, which is incredible when you think about it. I'll tell you another one that's interesting, another story. Uh, the, the story is about Barnabas. This is kind of interesting because Barnabas is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. The first time he's mentioned, though, is something very interesting, and that's Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 36 and 37. We say that Barnabas, you know, we know him because he was a companion of Paul in his missionary journeys. But how he started out was, well, it says in that passage I just quoted that he decided that he, had, he sold land and brought the money to the apostles. So if you sell a big piece of your investments, is that a big jar gift? That's big. And what happened as a result of that, his heart followed his treasure and he jumped in all in for good to serve with Paul. To me, this is amazing stuff. And it demonstrates what Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. If he hadn't done that big gift, it's very likely that he probably would not have been involved in the ministry as he was. So his heart followed that gift, or they were at least intertwined, I think is, is very safe to say. Incredible to see how a gift like that then inspired or motivated him to, to be more fully committed to it. Another interesting point there, if you don't mind me interrupting here, this is amazing to me. The fourth chapter of Acts also contains the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They were also at that second time the Holy Spirit was poured out and gave the apostles boldness and so on. But their covetousness cost them their lives and, and Barnabas' generosity gave him eternal life. It's just incredible. Day-to-day -day normal giving, appropriate and, and encouraged and so forth. But from time to time, some of these big gifts can, can have an eternal consequence, either for the good or not for the good, uh, depending on what we do with that. That's, that's incredible. Uh, let me read a statement here uh, as we kind of tie things up. This is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 518. It says, The recording angel makes a faithful record of every offering dedicated to God and put into the treasury, and also of the final result of the means thus bestowed. The eye of God takes cognizance of every farthing devoted to his cause and of the willingness or reluctance of the giver. 
The motive in giving is also chronicled. Those self-sacrificing consecrated ones who render back to God the things that are his as he requires of them will be rewarded according to their works. Even though the means thus consecrated be misapplied, so that it does not accomplish the object which the donor had in view, the glory of God and the salvation of souls, those who made the sacrifice in sincerity of soul with an eye single to the glory of God will not lose their reward. So if the offering, if the gift is given in good faith and the heart is right that makes that gift, even if it doesn't end up going in the right direction, they still receive a blessing from it. That's an amazing, isn't it? Amazing concept, really. So that's, that goes right along with, with the widow's mites. She, she had a heart that was right to serve God, thinking that this was God's church and so on. But even if, the, even if the, the leaders of the church didn't do appropriate things with it, they may have even used part of that money to pay Judas, so who knows? But she did the right thing because her heart was in the right spot, and the recording angel made note of it in heaven. So we can hope and expect and anticipate that ultimately if we do give gifts, they are going to go in the right direction. They are going to head uh, in, in the right, to the right place. And of course, their accounting procedures set up to make sure that that does indeed happen. But even if it doesn't, then we can still expect to receive uh, a blessing from that. Any final thoughts on offerings as we tie this week's uh, session up? Yes, I would just second what you just said. Most of the time, for sure, the offering goes where we intended because we do have auditors and if there's an offering taken for a certain thing, that's where it goes and so on. I can just tell you that I, I can, Kathy and I have experienced that it's more blessed to give than to receive. We've made a number of gifts this year that are what I would consider big jar gifts and it made us feel good that we were able to make the work go forward as we made those gifts. And I can tell you that throughout your life as you give, God blesses you, there's no question about it. You want him to be, a, you want to manage for the master in a way that can give him glory and, and honor him as well. So we thank God that there is an offering appeal from time to time and that we know the work is going forward. So one more way that you could receive a blessing from God when you give you also do indeed receive. This has been an exciting lesson this week looking at offering. Last week we looked at tithe. We still have a little ways to go through this quarter of 12 lessons and we're encouraged to have you with us as we make this journey. Until next week, God bless you. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you again next week on Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written.